So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Markets Thursday. We are October the 8th and I'm in London tonight. Uh, so quickly, I'm going to go as usual through my background. I started in 2000 in Paris as a cash equity trader. Then I moved to London in 2004, working for a hedge fund from 2004 to 2008 on the long only product and on the long short product. Then from 2009 to 2018, I work as a proprietary trader here in London for a company called Infinity Capital Markets. Since 2014, I've been mentoring people from all over the world. And since 2018, I've been managing my own money. I launched a 4x4 video series last year and I keep on mentoring people. So what are we going to be covering today? So today we will be starting with technical analysis and price action. As always, looking at the situation across asset classes, stocks, credit, commodities. Um, last week, we look at the Q3 performances. We're gonna do a market review, the recent performances and the catalyst. Then we will be looking at the PMI services. Last week, we look at the ISM manufacturing. So we had a lot of leading indicator for the services with the ISM services and the different PMI services. Then as this is really making all the headlines over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the US elections through the stimulus, US dollar, bonds, reflation, value versus growth. So many things to discuss. And then as always, we're going to be ending this, this uh, sorry, not this mentoring, but this webinar with a Q&A session. So let's start with the asset class performances. So here we start with a year to date asset performance for the different uh, asset class. Um, here on the left hand side, we get uh, the indexes where you can see again that the NASDAQ is the real hot performer. On the right hand side, we get the gold, the commodity, and really the losers are WTI, the FTSE, many index in Europe. In terms of currencies, uh, the dollar has been weakening this year by two to five percent. Um, and that is the overall picture. Now let's move into the week to date performance, uh, which is more interesting, where you can see since last uh, Thursday, so that's the, the prices that have been taken on the close as of yesterday, you can see that the Russell 2000 is up 7% on the week. So clearly outperforming any other indexes. The Shanghai index was closed, so China was closed for the week, uh, but emerging market have been doing well as well. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's a risk on market where all uh, uh, stock market have been going up. In terms of currencies um, versus the dollar, it has been pretty quiet. Having said that, if you've been trading uh, the Turkish Lira, that is now close to eight, um, that is uh, one to keep an eye on because clearly there is pressure on, on, on the Turkish Lira. This is not new, but there might be acceleration or at least um, uh, this is something that you need to monitor. The gold has been pretty flattish. WTI is up on the week. I think it's up another 2% today. Uh, around the $41. But overall, um, over the last three months, as we discussed over and over, WTI has been trading around the 40. OPEC today discussed uh, the supply and saying that uh, they are hoping that uh, the supply uh, will um, and the reserves will go away around half, um, the first half of, of 2021. So there is still probably 12 months of, um, of supply to come for, for WTI. And actually, if you look at the future contracts, that is telling you the same story, where the future contracts of the WTI are kind of flattish, at least for the next 18 months. Let's carry on with the other asset classes. So here we are looking at uh, the week-to-date sector's performance. And um, here, uh, if we look at the S&P 500, the S&P 500 is made of 11 sectors. So it's always interesting to look at how those different sectors have been doing on a weekly basis. Um, so funny enough, utilities have been really strong this week, 5%. Um, 
I think this is something that we're going to discuss later. But it's a bit of a, bit of, um, of a surprise if you think that um, bonds, um, at least the yields have been going up, which you will think that utilities might, might suffer from, from it. But in the utilities, you get a lot of uh, renewables uh, and, and that, have be, that has been helping the overall sector. Similarly, financials have benefited from the moves in, in bonds recently and the expectations of a fiscal stimulus are clearly helping the cyclical sectors like industrials and um, sorry, the materials. Um, so that is the overall um, move on the week. Uh, quite, uh, quite big alpha generation if you think about the winners at 5% with utilities and uh, versus technology, which has been uh, um, at 1%. So that is a different picture that we should, we have seen normally where technology have been not performing uh, over the last three months, most of the time. But um, here we can see that uh, at least over the last 10 days, there have been a bit of change and a rotation in the market. And um, if, you, if you drill further uh, from the sector level to the industries level, uh, and that explains as well why utilities are doing so well. The top leading industry has been solar, followed by uh, regional banks, the banks, the retail, metals, and mining. So again, uh, the banks, that is something that we're going to be covering later and why they have been benefiting from uh, the change in the bonds. Here, looking at the bonds, so that's the picture here. I like to be looking at how the bonds in terms of yields on, uh, and BIPs have been moving on the week to date. As you can see, if, and if you remember last week, we were saying that the bonds were pretty dull and not much was, was happening. Now, uh, I think they unleashed the dragon where um, the uh, US treasuries have been up 10 BIPs over the week. Um, so there has been some, some talk about reflation trade um some some fiscal stimulus some more supply coming for bonds so we went from roughly 65 bips to 75 bips or 0.75 percent for the us 10 years for the vix it's still the same story uh trading around 27 28 percent so the vix is the implied volatility for the next 30 months on the s p 500 and this implied volatility has been pretty high over the last three months, much higher uh, than the realized volatility. Why? Because uh, many market participants have been uh, paying quite a lot for hedging themselves or to have some protection coming into the elections. Plus there are different technical factors explaining the, the high implied volatility. But for you guys who, are uh, managing a portfolio, managing a book. That is something to keep in mind. That is not saying that the implied volatility could not go higher, but at this level of implied volatility, if you are hedging your portfolio, that is quite expensive. If we look at the top winners on the right hand side and the top losers, we can see that there has been some MA in uh, biotech uh, where uh, several um, uh, pharma companies. Uh, both with a decent premium, uh, that is an understatement, uh, some biotech company. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Cine uh, stock, which, um, um, so that has been one of the headlines for this week uh, on some uh, uh, companies, industry that are suffering for uh, a longer lockdown and that is affecting uh, those industries. I would like as well, uh, so that is a bit different, that is the money supply, M2 money supply, that is something we have been covering massively in March, April, May, June, uh, looking at the central bank's intervention. And here again, I want to go back at it because probably this is the, maybe the only chart that we should be looking at these days. So actually we should be looking at this M2 money supply, spending two minutes on it, and maybe that, <laughs> that should be it for, for, the, uh, for the webinar. The overall story is the following uh, central banks, ECB, Fed, Bank of Japan are still massively uh, putting money into the system. So M2 money stock. Uh, so those are all the data that you can find on, on, on the Fred website. 
and you can see uh, the spike that you had uh, for March, but that is still not stopping. So yes, we are probably not as aggressive as we were a couple of months ago, but still the, the money that is pushed into the system, the liquidity is massive. We know what the central bankers have been saying over the last couple of months. They are injecting liquidity in, this, in the system, but they will be very happy to see fiscal stimulus kicking in quite rapidly. And that's the case for the ECB. That's the case from, from the Fed. And Powell has been saying over uh, yesterday again that uh, they are expecting and they are hoping for a fiscal stimulus to happen soon. Uh, in terms of catalyst, so what's going to happen uh, over the next week? Uh, again, for you uh, managing your portfolio, always important to know what's going to happen next. Uh, Monday is an open is open in the US, but this is uh, Columbus Day, so that means the market is going to be pretty quiet. Um, and we have on the 13th the CPI. I think this is uh, important to look at how inflation. Uh, is gonna uh, is gonna um, react in the next uh, few months. Why? Because there is a lot of talks, uh, one way or another, that uh, there could be deflation or inflation. Uh, so there is many uh, many expectations. Plus, as I've been saying, the bonds have been moving quite a lot. So that is really something um, to keep under the radar. Um, on the 15th, we should have the presidential debate, but apparently it's, it's off. On the 16th, we get the retail sales and, and the new University of Michigan sentiment. Um, more importantly, uh, what is starting next week, uh, um, and in end with this, is from Tuesday, we get the earnings season. Uh, again, there is nothing on Monday because it's Columbus Day. But as you can see, and as I mentioned last week, I always look at when JP Morgan is coming with their earnings because they really kick in the earnings season. So JP Morgan is starting on Tuesday uh, and where we're going to have Citigroup as well. So Citigroup has been quite um, making the headlines over the last three weeks on, on risk management, on new CEO. So the overall sector, Citigroup, JP Morgan, and then on Wednesday, we get Bank of America. On Thursday, we get Morgan Stanley. Um, but overall, we're going to have other names that are going to be impacting uh, several um, uh, industries and sectors. So that is always helpful to look at those names and to see how early in the, in the earnings season those names are, are, are talking and, and, and uh, presenting, more importantly, what's going to happen for, for 2020. One. So if you think about this quarter, uh, it's all about now discussing for these companies what's going to happen in 2021. So even if the visibility is quite reduced, um, those management, those companies should be discussing what they are hoping for 2021. And that's going to have an implication, obviously, for EPS uh, going forward. So uh, similarly, on Wednesday, we get ASML, which is semiconductor. We get some airlines with UAL. We get some uh, UNH, which is big in the sector. Then on Friday, we get as well some uh, oil services, which have been absolutely murdered, some consumption retail with the FC and, and some other names. So I strongly advise you to start to be looking at um, where you have exposure and where uh, uh, you could see news uh, coming soon uh, with the earnings season. Let me jump into, as usual, with what we do, which is looking at the price action and what the technicals have been telling us. Uh, I would like to, to start, as always, with the S&P. So the S&P, as we discussed before, around the uh, OPEX, which, is, which happened on the third Friday of the month of September, experienced a sell-off, um, and since then, since we have this recovery in, in the positioning or this new positioning, the market has been nicely but surely uh, grinding higher. Um, so that is, th that is the picture at the moment. We are still 150 points roughly from, from the all-time high. But the S&P is, is clearly uh, so far acting pretty well. If you look at the NASDAQ, um, that is 
uh, really uh, something that we discussed last week. It is struggling uh, on the 11,500. Uh, so that's a level to, uh, um, to monitor. Um, quickly, if you look at Citigroup, that is the, something that we mentioned. Again, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how those uh, sectors and, and, and stocks will be behaving. Emerging market, so emerging market is very close to making new highs, uh, at least for, uh, uh, for the last six months. So today we had a good close around the 45.50. Again, that is uh, uh, something to monitor. Uh, emerging market have been very strong, um, despite all the possible news. Um, and, and, and the weakness of the dollar has been helping over the last three months. Um, so that's, that's for the sector. Uh, if we look at the 10 years versus the two years, so here we'll be looking at the US 10 years versus the uh, US two years. Um, there has been a bit of steepening of the yield curve. We are talking six bips. And when I say steepening, that means when the spread between the 10 years and the two years is just widening. So that, is, that has been helping the financials. That is, there is a lot of talk. So if you go on Twitter, you'll think, okay, there is just a massive steepening of the yield curve. We are at lower level than we were in June or when we were in March. So still, this is, uh, uh, this is higher than it was a couple of weeks ago, but that is still not crazy. Um, if we go into the commodities, uh, so we get 41.30 on, on the WTI. Again, as I said, over the last uh, quarter, we have been trading between 38 and, and 44, but with an average uh, around the 40. The gold, again, many positions here for uh, many retail traders. It is still um, uh, struggling under this, um, this line here, uh, nothing is broken. That is something to, uh, to monitor. Um, as we discussed last week, there has been a strong correlation with the US dollar. Euro dollar, uh, almost back to square one, that uh, the level that we had uh, since August. Um, so a lot of noise. Again, FX, there is always a lot of noise. Be careful. I know that many retail traders uh, started their um, journey into uh, currencies and then they get uh, quickly murdered. But the overall picture is telling you this, uh, there might be a clear change in the euro dollar. Um, and that's, uh, if you can, based on the macro and as well, looking at the technicals, you can have, uh, you could have some nice confirmation. Uh, Turkish Lira that we mentioned before, I mean, this is the one that keeps on going, on giving, uh, getting close to eight. Uh, the reserves, uh, the eff FX reserves of Turkey are, are coming down. I don't know how they're going to deal with it. I don't know when the story is going to stop. But clearly, uh, this is a vicious circle for the over overall economy. Um, last week, I mentioned some... Um, so some ideas and how to, uh, to look at different stocks based on breakout. So those are the few names that um, I've been following. So here we get the FinTech ETF. Uh, we get iPay, again, which is another ETF. You get names like Square that have been uh, absolutely uh, on fire. So let me put that on a daily chart. Um, if you look here at the Poulter, which is more, uh, it's more than it's building. Uh, it has been breaking out as well. Baba has been breaking. Uh, Rollins is close to, to break. So you have different breakouts for different sectors. Of course, uh, IT has got more chances of finding stocks that will be break based on the earnings growth and the sales growth that this sector is experiencing. But, uh, when you do the mentoring, when you do the four by four, we try as well to generate ideas and find the winners and the losers for each sectors and industries. So what about we go back now into the PowerPoint and we go into the first topic, which is ISM services. So last week we discussed the 
ISM manufacturing for those of you who are just joining for the first time. Uh, so ISM services is uh, a leading indicator in the US that is extremely helpful based on survey uh, on a survey. Uh, if you want for more information, you can go on the ISM website um, where the overall ID is if you look at the 50 level above 50 um, uh, people that answer the surveys are telling you that it, they feel better versus last month and obviously the other way around. So if you look at the ISM services and the ISM manufacturing, what is helpful is they have many uh, uh, details in their uh, surveys. Here we have the headline number on the left hand side and the new orders um, on the right hand side. We know that across the world manufacturing have been uh, um, uh, bouncing qu quite nicely but services have been struggling uh, and that is very very true uh, for regions like Europe. Concerning uh, the US, the last ISM services, especially the new orders were pretty, pretty okay. Um, so I think this is a decent report that we had in the US concerning the ISM services. Um, so here we get an overall picture from the ISM services uh, headline, the new orders, which is 4.7% higher. But overall, again, the picture is pretty good. So that tells you, if you think about what part of the world might be doing well over the last three months on a relative basis, uh, the US region is probably going to be doing better at least than Europe and some part of Asia. Uh, as always, if you look into the details, if you have questions, I don't want to be spending too much time, but if you have questions, that is something that is very well covered in the 4x4. Um, as well, you can be sending me questions. I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. So you can send me an email or find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, but what is helpful if you look at the ISM services and uh, the manufacturing, there is ranking, there are details on the, sec on, on the different sectors that are doing well, that are trending well, and the sectors that are not trending that well. So if you look at the ISM services for the month of September, uh, both on the index level and the new orders, it, the utility sector printing very well. Um, but as always, when we uh, do ID generation, and this is something that spend a lot of time when you start to do the mentoring sessions, is you don't want to be uh, reading the ISM and not to be thinking. And my struggle these days is obviously utilities. If you look at the performance, I've been doing pretty well. I think it has been explained by the renewables mostly. Um, but as well, you need to think where and what could happen in the next six to 12 months. And, and so you get the ISM telling you utilities are trending nicely. And on the other hand, we get the raising interest rates, which are not and will not help the sector because uh, utilities are by definition using a lot of their balance sheets, so they are heavily indebted. And we might see tax increases from uh, the Biden administration. And here you can argue that it's going to be the same for everyone. But if you watch some of the webinars before, you know that utilities have been, has been one of the sectors that benefited the most from uh, the tax cuts, tax cuts sorry, in in the in the past so always when you look at the ism services uh, look at what the comments have been um, again the the comments for this month have been pretty good so if we look at mining activity level is holding steady with optimistic outlook if we look at construction work orders are improving rapidly but there is a but because you always need to read between the lines is lack of available labor is having a significant impact on our ability to fulfill orders. What does that mean here? That means that some of the builders might be facing uh, margin compression. Then if we look at retail trade, uh, they are telling us that the picture is pretty good. Uh, but there might be as always seasonal impact like recent hurricanes. Um, but that is important uh, these days to be looking at retail. Why? Because we are going into the end of the year. 
and the end of the year is the most important quarter for retail uh, based on, on Thanksgiving and, uh, and Christmas. And that means that if retail is not going to do well over the, the last two months of the year, this is really going to be a tough year. And that explained a lot why uh, the Republicans and the Democrats are very keen, even if they are struggling to find a deal, they are still keen on, on making um, a fiscal push because they know that really those two months, November and December, are extremely, extremely important. If you miss on those months, then this is really a struggle. So unless we have a fiscal stimulus push, um, we know as well that the U.S. consumption has been a bit struggling over the last couple of months based on the end of this um, help or this uh, uh, check that every American was receiving um, if they lost their job. Similar to the ISM services, we get the PMI services from market. Um, so here, this is the overall picture with the global uh, US, China, uh, Eurozone, Japan, Germany, France, and the UK. Um, US for the month of September, as I said, have been doing fine. The UK as well have been doing pretty well, but there is some parts of Europe that have been really struggling. <laughs> so some of you will say that this is not new for Europe to be struggling. Uh, but uh, Italy, uh, France, and, and more importantly, Spain really had a, re uh, had a bad uh, ISM uh, uh, PMI services. So that is a space um, to watch. You can be monitoring the 10 years, so you can be monitoring bonds, and you can be monitoring as well ETF. And for those of you who have access to uh, uh, European stocks, uh, I think there are some good um, uh, pair trade to do based on, on, on this arbitrage. Um, so that, that is something to, to monitor. So let's jump now into the uh, US elections because really this is making the headlines. I know it is a bit of a pain sometimes to have all those tweets and, and all this noise, but I try to put aside the noise and trying as always uh, uh, the facts. So here, we get uh, the US election polls about if and will the Democrats win the White House, the, Sen the Senate and the House in 2020. And as you can see, since the uh, last debate and the start of October, there has been uh, clearly the polls going uh, for uh, the Democrats winning everything. Okay, And the market has been like this ID. I mean, the stocks uh, equity um, enjoyed uh, the ID of the Democrats winning everything. Uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, I, I want to, I think you, you need to have a, uh, to give a bit of a pinch of salt here. Um, why is, is, I think if you look at what happened over the last years is because we had a good balance between Democrats and Republicans, um, things in the US kind of work. If you give the power, if you give too much power left or right, um, then, then that could be an issue. So I know at the moment that everyone is saying, hoo-ha, this is fantastic and we need Democrats. And my view is not to say, I don't like Democrats or um, I like Republicans or the other way around. I just think that um, you need to have a, a balance uh, between uh, uh, politicians. And, and I'm not sure that uh, um, having a full Democrat uh, um, uh, winning the White House, the Senate, Senate and the House is necessarily a good thing. But this is what is happening. And the picture is, uh, it, it is um, affecting the US dollar. So that's something that we covered as well. But if you think about uh, the Democrats and more than the Republicans is they are pushing massively for uh, a fiscal stimulus. Okay, so the Republicans were kind of hawkish to push for 1.1 trillion first, then 1.5 trillion. Democrats are more to 2 to 2.5 trillion, but there are talks that overall if Biden is winning, we might be going into the four to six trillions overall over three to four years. 
So if you think about six trillions versus 20 trillion GDP uh, for the US, that gives you 30%. So that's almost 10% fiscal stimulus every year. So if you combine this first fiscal stimulus with the uh, current deficit, uh, you end up with a, a twin deficit. And to finance a twin deficit, you get more or less two options. Either you lower the US dollar or you get higher interest rates, okay? Um, and as we get the Fed pledging for rates to be low for long, maybe the only way uh, is going to be for uh, the weakening of the US dollar. So that has been one of the calls. I think it's uh, uh, Stephen Roach from uh, ex Morgan Stanley that pushed for, pushed for the idea that for a strong uh, devaluation is the big word, but the weakening of the US dollar over the next few years based on this twin, twin deficit. And as you know, if you've been traveling the world, uh, that uh, so far, uh, dollar is seen as the only alternative, so uh, TINA. Um, and when you do an FX trade, for those of you who are trading FX, you are buying one currency and selling another currency versus another currency. So, so we should always be thinking when we do FX and when we look at macro uh, uh, through, F, through the FX angle, that we do an absolute and a relative trade. And why? It is important because there has been recently a high debate um, on, on if the US dollar will stay as the reserve status currency um, over the next few years and if it will be attacked. So that's something we're going to try to cover quickly. I'm not um, pretending that I get the solution and I know everything, but I, I think that is important for you guys to get a bit of a, of a picture of what is happening in the macro world. So if we look at the US election uh, 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 with the implication of dollar, here this is a chart that I, that I really like, which is giving you on the left hand side, the twin deficit, as you can see from 0% to minus 6%, 16%, where the twin deficit um, are standing for both the fiscal uh, deficit and the current account deficit. And on the right hand side, we get the DXY. So I know that some, some people will say that, you know, putting a dual uh, charts is just uh, data mining. Still, I think there is correlation. If we look at the DXY, which is the, uh, the dollar index. Uh, so it is a measure of the value of the US dollar versus uh, the value of a basket of currencies, mainly euro which is making 50 to 60 percent and if you look at the chart here you can see the correlation between the twin deficit and um and the dollar uh, and the dollar index i know as well one of the criticism looking at this chart is saying the us is is not the only economy uh, facing a huge um, uh, deficits, dual deficits. So that is to, uh, uh, as this is relative, we need to take a pinch of salt. But you can see as well that if the uh, uh, deficit is uh, um, around the minus 12 to 18 percent, and we know that this is not going to be only for this year, it's going to be for next year as well. Why? Because doesn't matter if it's going to be the Democrats or the Republicans, but we're going to be, they're going to be running between 1.5 to 2.5 trillion uh, um, fiscal deficit. That means what? At least that means what? Probably 10% uh, uh, fiscal deficit plus the 3% on the current deficit, you end up with minus 13%. So if you look at this chart, you, you could argue that uh, the dollar should be could go down by 20 percent so again this is just factual uh, I'm, I'm not making any calls i'm just looking at the facts we discussed briefly if the dollar is still a reserve currency and here there has been a lot of talks of people saying you know uh, the dollar is not going to stay as the reserve currency so here i took uh, the data from um, the BIS, 
um, which is the Bank of, Inter of International Settlements. And um, I look at the different currency and how for each uh, global foreign exchange trade, which currency that we had. So here, if you think before that was non-euro, after that we had the euro. And obviously you need to combine this number to make up 200%. Why? Because again, when you do an FX trade, you're buying one currency and you're selling another one. But what you can see is over the last 20 years, <laughs> the dollar is making roughly 88% of any trade. So for any FX that is happening over the last 20 years, 88% 88, 88 of the time, the dollar was um, on one of the two legs. Meaning what? So far, so good in terms of the US dollar as the reserve currency. By definition, when you are that strong and, and that big into, into the numbers, there might be a change on the way down. But so far, nothing is happening. And Obviously, for the Bitcoin, for the cryptocurrency guys, they will tell you that this is the way to go and, and crypto will uh, um, reduce the FX as the reserve currency, as um, the Euro uh, pros will tell you the same, or uh, uh, the Chinese will tell you that the RMB will be a reserve currency. Based on what has been happening over the last 20 years, nothing has been, uh, has been really moving. So that is a call that is, uh, uh, I've been um, uh, quite long for, for happening. Um, now for the US election, I want to jump into the Goldman Sachs uh, chart, which I think is interesting, where they give us, here we are moving in the stock world, um, looking at the EPS expectations for the S&P. So their baseline in 2021, which stands at 170 US dollar. So if you take the close of the S&P today, which is roughly 3,400, you get a PE of 20. Um, and what is interesting is now, <laughs> even Goldman, uh, JP Morgan, all the brokers, after saying that, you know, maybe it was not that great to have Biden based on, on, on tax uh, going up, now, because they want to do business and obviously they feel like Biden and Harris are going to be the winners, that it's not that bad for the market. And actually, that could be pretty good for the equity market. So if you look over the last couple of weeks and couple of days, uh, uh, reports from Morgan Stanley, from uh, Goldman Sachs, from, from JP Morgan, they all came out with those um, uh, charts telling you this is the numbers that we should be expecting from, from earnings based on, 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 on the win of Biden and Harris. Um, so you can work with the numbers. You can see now what the market is now pricing in terms of P. You can as well think about what are going to be the earnings growth. Uh, many, many of those numbers are, are based on the fiscal stimulus as well. So a fiscal stimulus, one way or another, is going to be extremely important. Um, there have been talks tonight that actually uh, the Democrats might want to delay everything just um, uh, in a way to make it bigger when they are in charge at the end of this year. Um, but that's the overall uh, picture in terms of earnings. Now I want to move from... from um, from stocks into the euro dollar and what are the expectations from the market uh, regarding um, uh, the, uh, the Fed expectations. So again, if you have time, go through uh, several of the webinars that I've done in the past and we always look at the euro dollar futures and that is extremely helpful because the euro dollar futures are extremely liquid and we have uh, quite co uh, many contracts going into the future. So this is the euro dollar curve and it is about uh, uh, more or less uh, comparing what you have today versus what you're going to happen in the future. If you take the 99.50 as uh, the threshold, which more or less a 25 bips from what we have here, 
it is happening now in December 2023. So what is the bottom line is if you remember a couple of months ago, we were saying that the market was not pricing anything to happen uh, in terms of rate hikes before June 2024 at best, whereas now the market is pricing the Fed to hike by 25 bips in December 2023. That tells you many, many things. That tells you, as we discussed before, that it felt like uh, uh, um, the, f um, the market was pricing something pretty aggressively of nothing happening. Okay, so that was not a free option, but if you are a bit of a contrarian, um, that was obviously the good trade. That is uh, the opposite trade of what people did with the euro dollar at the start of the year, of the year uh, in, in, in January, February, and March. So here you have the opposite. Now you need to know. Um, you need to know, maybe not know, but uh, it's about, you know, um, trying to find out if there's going to be a follow-up. But what you can see from uh, this euro dollar curve is the Fed expectations have been moving based on inflation, based on, um, on the fiscal stimulus, based on the lot of supply coming, of treasuries coming into the market. So... The Fed might have to, to fight um, if they don't want uh, yields to go up too quickly. And um, the, I think this is why always, why I want to build, uh, the when I build this webinar, is trying to give you the link uh, between what is happening first and now, is looking at the next catalyst. If you look at the CPI that is coming next week, that might be very interesting to know uh, um, when, how the CPI will be and how the credit market will be reacting. But that's a chart that I, that I uh, tweeted a couple of days ago. So here we get the um, uh, same, that is the uh, euro dollar future December 2023. And as you can see, we went from 99.60 to 99.52. So roughly 10 bips change over the last uh, five sessions. That is quite a, a, a big move. Uh, for a market that was pricing nothing to happen for quite a long time, lower for longer or lower forever. So that has been, there, have, there has been a change um, in the market. Is it based on inflation? So as we discussed, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, we look at the market likes to look at this big concept, which is a bit of a, um, of a tough one, which is the five-year, five-year, five-year forward inflation expect expectation, right? For me, it's a bit of a, um, of a hard concept to swallow because uh, I think it's, it's pretty hard to um, extrapolate what's going to be inflation in five years for the five years uh, onwards. Um, but um, I don't think that this five-year, five-year has been moving that much. So, um, uh, Meaning, um, is the move that we had recently in the, um, in the Fed expectation based on higher inflation? I don't think this is a case. If that's not the case, that is maybe on higher growth coming from the overall economy. Um, I think it's as well more the fiscal stimulus, uh, meaning higher deficit, um, meaning higher treasuries coming uh, uh, and a kind of crowding out of, of treasuries uh, uh, from the credit market. Um, I like as well, um, so it's, I hope it's not too confusing. I try to cover as much as possible of what has been happening uh, over the last uh, 10 days in terms of, of, um, of assets. Um, so here we're looking at the US 10 years versus the US two years. So that's something that we cover already when we look at technicals. Um, so uh, uh, the, the, the 10 years versus the two years is mainly about thinking what if there's going to be a, a, a reflation trade. Um, and the reflation trade is something that was very in favor just before the U.S. election uh, in 2016, 2016 when Trump won, and as well after the Trump election. So after the Trump election, there were a lot of talks in the market that uh, we will have a massive reflation for in the US and actually that uh, PCE, CPI 
will go up a lot. Um, and after six months, you can see the trend, it carried on uh, 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 again. So here, we don't have the same spike, but there has, there has been a lot of talks of reflation trade in the market uh, uh, through the, the 10 versus the two years. I think um, so far the price action is not, is not going uh, that much because we are back to the level that we had recently. But um, I think the big difference from 2016, you could argue, and, and it's not even arguing, is in 2020 and 2021, we're gonna have a fiscal stimulus, okay? And this fiscal stimulus, as we mentioned, in terms of GDP, percentage to GDP, is massive. So you might see inflation coming. I'm not smart enough to tell you if there's gonna be inflation, but that is a huge difference from 2016, where Trump was saying we're gonna have a huge fiscal stimulus that we didn't have uh, 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 to, uh, uh, so big. So um, in terms of the steepening of the yield curve, the 10 versus the two, the 30 versus the, the 10, we are at level uh, that are close to um, uh, the peak that we had three or six months ago. We have not been broken yet those levels, but that is clearly something to monitor. Why this is something to monitor, not only for the, for the bonds, but I know that most of you are trading stocks, equities, and that means it, it is having huge implication for ID generation, sector allocation, and industry allocation. So if you look at the sectors as we've done 15 minutes ago, that have massively benefited uh, from the recent moves, obviously we get the banks. So the banks, if you think about it, they massively normally benefit from a steepening of the yield curve. And if you do have like the yield curve steepening even more, that should be good for the banks. Um, so now if you look at KBE, XLF, it's back to level that we had a couple of months ago. Um, um, to have a follow-up, I think you will need first uh, another leg in the steepening of the yield curve. And um, obviously, next week, we get the biggest catalyst, which are the earnings coming, uh, uh, starting, as we said on Tuesday, with JP Morgan. And, and what you don't want to have is the second wave of lockdown. Because if you do have like a second wave of lo lockdown, if you remember the JP Morgan earnings uh, just after the lockdown, they clearly said that uh, they will be hit badly and they had to put a lot of provisions against it. So clearly uh, uh, monitor uh, the sector, monitor those uh, 10 versus the two, the 30 versus the, uh, uh, the 10. US elections again, um, in terms of, of industry sectors, uh, something that we have been working on over the last three weeks is depending who's going to be winning, which industries could be benefiting from it. And here we get on, on our eyes on the uh, um, clean energy ETF. And as you can see, uh, since, the, uh, since we had the debate in the US and since the market made up his mind that the Democrats will win everything, those sectors have been on a tier. So renewables, uh, the solar industries, have been benefiting massively, up 30%. That has helped as well utilities. If you look again at the banks, there have been winners. Um, as I've been saying last week and the week before, if you want to do a degeneration and looking at basket and sectors or industry that could be winning, this is the time to do it because there is huge alpha generation to be doing here. Quickly, um, my education, first with the four by four video series. So this is something that I built last year of uh, six months. Uh, that is a very comprehensive online video course uh, to get a professional investment process based on my 20 years experience as a portfolio manager and educator. I launched a product in October, 2019. So you will not rely on a product that was done five or 10 years ago, meaning that you will have all the different concepts and uh, things that are important in 
uh, in, in today market, looking at uh, gamma, looking at delta, looking at options, looking at central banks, looking at different ways of generating ideas. So that is based on macro analysis. And as well, I'll try to help you building your infrastructure for trade ID generation across asset classes with my background with a focus on stocks. ID generation, you'll be using four filters, top down, bottom up, special situation, active trading. I know that many of you have been stuck with other educators with a top down and have not been doing well because they have been struggling. I know as well that if you want to have fundamental analysis, if you want to go deep into understanding of sector industries and companies, the 4x4 video series will help you massively. 4x4, you're going to have 40 videos plus, you're going to have more than 30 hours of footage and you're going to have 50 Excel spreadsheet that will be updated. And as well, I'll give you all the sources, meaning that you don't have to pay a stupid price just to have updated data. For the testimonials, you can go on the website and for more information, either you go into education, uh, but as well, you can send me an email. The second part of my education is the mentoring program where you could do first the 4x4 video series, which will help you massively. But sometimes this is not necessary uh, if you are already an advanced trader. This is a 12 weekly one on one online session. So today we have people that have done the mentoring and it's about building your infrastructure and learning how to trade real money in real time where I'm going to help you to interpret macro indicators the way I'm doing it today to generate quality trade IDs similar to what I do with the 4x4 video series and what I've been doing over the last 20 years I use top down bottom up active trading and special situation and we try to do together to generate IDs every week um, in order to build a balanced portfolio using different asset classes time frames and strategies for some of you, that might be for you to build your track record if you want to have access to the industry. And for some others, just uh, for um, uh, increasing your personal wealth. What about we do the Q&A session? Thank you, Eduardo. Happy anniversary to the 4x4.